Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about ecological pyramids, uh, another classic in the study of ecology. And what's interesting about these ecological pyramids is they come in three kinds. There's the pyramid of energy, or sometimes called productive pyramid, and there's also a biomass and a numbers pyramid. And so let's get into this conversation. I think you'll enjoy it. And so one of the things that I want to mention about uh, ecological pyramids, I'm going to start off with the energy pyramid. And so I may have mentioned this before in a previous video, but if you didn't catch that, I'm going to say tell, tell you now that energy comes into the ecosystem or into the community via photosynthesis. And so autotrophs are capturing that energy of the sun. Like, for example, this is a plant right here. This is a caterpillar, which is a consumer, but the energy is coming in. It's being stored in the form of organic material, principally carbohydrates. And so that's what we call primary production. And so that's going to determine how many trophic levels are going to be able to be sustainable is how much primary production. But what I want to talk to you now is that there's a lot of loss of energy as you move up the trophic levels. And so that's why we call it a pyramid. There's more energy on the bottom level and less as you move to the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels. There's about 90% loss at each transfer between levels. Only 10% is moving on. And so that's kind of a, kind of a large concept to, uh, to get your head around. And so sometimes this idea of what is available to the next level is what we call secondary production. In other words, what is the energy available in terms of organic material in, let's just say, in a single organism. Let's scale it down to this caterpillar here. So what's available to the bird, in other words, uh, that's going to be eating the caterpillar? And so for, first thing I want to say is that, you know, all this energy is coming in from the sun and it's being uh, picked up and all this, all this vegetation is growing. Not all of the ve vegetation is being consumed. That's one thing. So there's already a lot of energy uh, stored in carbohydrates that isn't moving on to the next level because it's simply not being consumed. So let's just say that it is being consumed. So here's a caterpillar that's cruising along and it's chomping on the leaf. And so as it turns out, uh, not sure about your background in the biochemistry of sugars, but a lot of what a leaf is, is carbohydrate. And a lot of that carbohydrate is in the cell wall of the leaf and the cell wall is primarily made up of a polysaccharide called cellulose which is indigestible it cannot be broken down so as it turns out the caterpillar when it's eating that sugar is not utilizing it for energy but rather it's just passing through the digestive system so a lot of the energy goes in and then it goes out in the form of feces. So, so here we are with starting our video talking about feces here. But look at this, about half of the energy. And you know, the unit that we're looking at here is something, an energy, a, a unit of energy called a joule. But it's here nor there. But basically half the energy that was available here is not going into the caterpillar. It's being, it's passing right through. And then, you know, you, you get, for example, uh, cell respiration. Let's talk about that. So the sugar, so the simple sugars, like the glucose and fructose or what have you, that is being consumed by the, by the caterpillar is then being burned. And again, this comes back to this notion of, you know, the law of conservation of energy. Of course, energy is conserved. In other words, the potential energy in the sugar is conserved by, because it equals uh, kinetic energy. But the truth is, once the sugars are broken down, it's lost in the form of usable energy to the next level. So it's heat. So heat is being released and the energy is being broken down. And so um, what is this for? It's, it's to power the growth of the organism. So the long story short is that the energy from the sun, only 10% of it is going to be stored in the caterpillar for the next level up. Okay, so that's important to consider. So 
we're going to be looking at these three different kinds of energy, uh, sorry, ecological pyramids, but they all kind of have something in common with one another. In other words, it all has to do with energy ultimately. So energy is going to, the energy available is going to de decrease as you move up. And so it's going to be like starting off with 100% and then you'll get, again, 10%, which is 10% of 100, and then 1% and then 0.1. So there's only 10% of the energy that can move along. And as a result of that, uh, the numbers pyramid is going to be reflective of that. There's a lot more producers than there are, for example, tertiary consumers because there just simply isn't enough biomass or if you will, numbers of primary producers in order to sustain that. So the population sizes will decrease in consumers and literally the biomass will decrease as well. And so we're gonna, let's look at that. So just to sort of keep things practical, you can even try to investigate this question if you wanted to look it up on the, on the internet. Say you were owning a ranch and you wanted to, you moved, moved to Vermont and say you wanted to uh, have some cattle and you're wondering how much land am I going to need? And, and so you're like, well, I don't know how many, like how much grass, here's the question, how much grass is needed? So plant material, primary productivity, how much grass is needed to support a cow? And so, okay, there's a lot to that. In other words, like, you know, how big's the cow and all of these considerations, consider that. I think you'll be surprised there. It really is a lot. And so this is what we're talking about. Uh, there's a lot of uh, primary producers and then fewer herbivores. And then again, even fewer secondary consumers. And so it all has to do with energy. And so when you look at this, the amount of energy coming in the form of sun and then plants are picking up again, a, a basically about a tenth of that. And then what goes on to the next level is only 10% of that and 10% and then 10%. And so let me emphasize this by writing this out. So only 10% transfer for, from each trophic level moving on up. And so there's a tremendous amount of loss of energy in the form of heat and, and growth and basically feces. And so there's a lot of loss. So only 10% of energy moves through the ecosystem, okay? So as a, as a consequence of that, again, here's, here's another look at numbers. You go from 1,000 to a 100 to 10 to 1 and 0.1. So 10% move uh, of energy through the trophic levels. And so as a consequence of that, biomass is reflective of this. And so you need a lot more organisms, a lot more producers than you do of these other levels. And I say a lot more, I'm sort of mentioning numbers. But what biomass really is all about is if you're studying a particular area, this happens to be like a Florida bog, but it doesn't have to be. What we're talking about is like the, the weight, in other words, the dry grams per meter square. So if you had something like this, so if, say you're studying a meter square plot, and you're literally standing there like this, and you're wondering, okay, um, here's my meter squared, and you're wondering in terms of biomass, so you're gonna collect all of the plant material and dry it up, and then you're going to place it on a digital scale and you're going to record that. And then you're gonna go in here and look, okay, how many, what are the primary consumers? What are the herbivores? And you're gonna collect them and then you put that on the scale and then the next level up and collect them and put that on the scale. And so what you're gonna see is literally the weight is gonna decrease. And this is what we mean by biomass. There's a lot more biomass on the primary producer level than there is in the, in the consumer levels. Okay, so this is like a pyramid, again like that, a pyramid of biomass. And so the numbers reflect this as well. There's a lot more autotrophic organisms than there are tertiary consumers. So the numbers pyramid is reflective of both biomass and energy. It all looks like this. But what's fascinating is sometimes you have to be careful about uh, there's some exceptions to this in terms of a pyramid of number. And let me just give you something like, for example, you know, you're like, oh, there's a lot more grass and then you have fewer deer 
and then you have just a couple of wolves and you're like okay i could appreciate that but look at this like you can come into this area and go okay how many how many uh plant ah, one oak tree <laughs> and so there you go one and then how many caterpillars are in here and then you're like wow well, there's two thousand caterpillars and then there's you know again as you move up and there's one hawk in the area and so it's kind of your traditional number pyramid but sometimes it can be odd that the producer is a little bit uh, less but basically it's always a pyramid shape but I just want to point that out sometimes you get some anomalies and so just to close this discussion on on uh, ecological pyramids I just wanted to like re revolve this around humanity a little bit like in terms of energy again if you look at corn which is one of the main fuels of the human population, sources of energy, you could see that the energy transfer from corn to the primary, so in other words, a vegetarian, is again only 10%, which means that there's only a few individuals that can be sustained by the corn. But if you look over here at this pyramid, if we're not eating on the primary consumer level, we're eating on the secondary level. In other words, we're eating we're being carnivores and we're eating cattle. There's fewer individuals that can be sustained. So in other words, this is 10% and then 10% of that. And so if you're talking about human populations and, and increasing, it's like, look in the future, if we're able, if we're eating mainly cattle, we're, the human population won't be able to maintain itself because we're, there's not enough energy. Whereas if we're eating on a lower level, now I don't really have an agenda in terms of whether or not you're a, a vegetarian or, or a meat eater. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not casting judgment on you, but I'm just saying the facts are that if humans are able to eat at a lower trophic level, we can sustain a larger population. And that, you know, that's, that's a serious matter. And, then, and in addition to that, there's, you know, when you're, again, you're eating meat, you're not getting the same amount of energy that you would be when you're eating corn. And also, it takes not only uh, carbohydrate, but just, just showing that water is an important resource too when it comes to humanity. It takes about 2,500 gallons of water per pound of beef. So that's a lot of water consumption. So th these, all this cattle is out there eating up all this corn and so that takes up a lot of land as well. So you're using a lot of land for the cattle to eat that all, that could be used just for agricultural purposes. So you got this eating a lot of corn and drinking a lot of water. And so the, the question remains, and I know we might like a burger every once in a while, but in terms of sustainability, in terms of conservation and balance uh, for the future, I think it might be clear that uh, cattle isn't going to be the way to sustain the, the future human populations in the future. And so I hope that was a little insight in terms of the ecological pyramids, both energy, which drives everything, the biomass, and the pyramid of numbers. I hope you enjoyed that, and thanks for watching.